Okay, uh, good afternoon and welcome to this forum discussion of the OSCE and security in a new world. My name is Thomas Bierstaker. I'm the Kurt Gosteiger Professor of International Security and Conflict Studies here at the Graduate Institute. I'm also on the advisory board of the Center on Conflict Development and Peace Building, which is a co-sponsor of this event and also the director of the program for the study of international governance, which is also, of course, relevant to our subject today. The Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, or the OSCE, is usually not among the first international organizations that come to mind when one contemplates global security institutions. We think of the UN Security Council, uh, the activities of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or any, even the African Union feature typically uh, more prominently in many discussions. Yet the OSCE was propelled into global prominence earlier this year when the crisis in Ukraine developed as a key issue on the global agenda. The OSCE has subsequently become the principal forum for negotiation between two of the major protagonists in the conflict, Russia and Ukraine, both of which are founding members of the regional security organization. And like most international organizations, the presidency of the OSCE rotates among its members on a periodic basis. And as luck would have it, Switzerland uh, has assumed the presidency for a year-long term this current year. And I think it's fortunate that a country that has uh, the competence, the institutional capacity, and the characteristic of neutrality uh, of Switzerland has provided leadership to the OSCE during this profound period of international crisis and challenges to some core norms of international governance. We have with us today a distinguished panel of, uh, to, to discuss the OSCE and its role in contemporary global security. And to introduce them to you, it's my pleasure to welcome Ms. Ursula Froza, who's the editor of the OSCE magazine, Security Community, that I think many of you have copies of. But before she begins to introduce each of the speakers, let me also introduce and welcome Dr. Jean-Marc Flugiger uh, from the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs to say a few words on behalf of the Swiss chairmanship of the OSCE. So Mr. Flugiger, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, dear professors, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Swiss Chairmanship of the OSCE, I'd like to thank you for your kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you at this event dedicated to the OSC and security in a new world. In recent months, the OSC region had to face one of its deepest crises since the end of the Cold War, the situation regarding Ukraine. The OSC and the Swiss Chairmanship have been so far at the forefront of the efforts to find a solution to this crisis. And perhaps the best known and most visible step undertaken by the organization was the establishment of the so-called special monitoring mission, um, who was agreed upon consensus of all 57 participating states on March 21st. The various roles played by the special monitoring mission in the framework of its mandate demonstrate the flexibility of the OSC in adapting to the changing needs on the ground. But let me also give you three other examples of how the OSC is making efforts to adapt to the challenges of the world, of the new world of the 21st century. First, under the Swiss chairmanship and following the efforts made by the United Nations and the UN Security Council, the OSC and its participating states started a discussion on the issues of kidnapping for ransom, as well as on foreign terrorist fighters. Both phenomena represent some of the most pressing security challenges to the OSC region, from Central Asia to the Caucasus, from Europe to North America. Switzerland has started this consultation process to see whether consensus by the 57 participating states can be achieved on these topics in 2014. Second, in the field of information and communication technologies, the OSC has been the first organization to adopt, at the end of 2013, a set of 11 confidence-building measures worldwide. By promoting exchanges of information between participating states, the aim of the measures is to reduce the risks of conflicts stemming from the use of information and communication technologies. And my last example, third, um, in 2012, the OSC participating states decided to start a reform process 
the so-called Helsinki Plus 40 process, which should enable the organization to adapt to the challenges of the 21st century. This process is structured around eight thematic clusters, which cover all dimensions of the OSC. Through combined efforts in all these clusters, the past, current, and future chairmanships are seeking to adapt the organization to the new challenges of the 21st century. Furthermore, in a side event last week in New York, the chairmanship in office, the chairman in office and Swiss Foreign Minister Didier Burkhalter also discussed the initiation of a Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian reflection process on whether and how we can reconsolidate European security as a common project. So these three examples, or four examples, I just wanted to give you a brief, non-exhaustive overview of how the OSC and its participating states are making efforts to adapt to the security challenges of the 21st century. I'm very much looking forward for the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen, professors, students, um, I would say we're actually all students. Um, things are moving very quickly um, on the international scene and uh, we, we're all learning and it's important that we share what we do learn and that's the reason that we're here today. I'm very pleased to represent the, the communications and media relations section of the OSCE um, from the Secretariat in Vienna. Um, and uh, uh, I want to start by expressing our sincere thanks uh, to Jacqueline Coté, uh, the Director of Public Relations here at the Graduate Institute, um, who had the wonderful idea uh, back in the spring that uh, we should organize an event together in your uh, amazing uh, venue, and here we are. Uh, so it's been wonderful to work with her and her team to, to organize this joint event, and uh, I want uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, how uh, it came about to specify it uh, the way it is specified. At that time, Ukraine was just um, still a very, uh, you didn't really know which way uh, the crisis in Ukraine would go. Uh, there were some very interesting things happening on the Maidan. Crimea was just about uh, to uh, be uh, invaded, taken, annexed to Russia. Uh, things were getting very intense and ugly. and. Uh, our life became uh, very much different than it has been in the, in the past years. The OCE, as you know, is an institution which is dedicated to preventing conflict. And for the communications department, if there's no news, that's good news. So we have actually uh, uh, changed our mode of operation uh, 180 degrees since the Ukraine crisis started. Things are extremely busy. Um, as was mentioned, the OCE has been at the center of uh, international response because the OSCE was founded way back in the Cold War um, as a forum for dialogue and then um, in the post-Cold uh, War period has for 20 years developed a whole series of tools and institutions um, and mechanisms and experience uh, on uh, resolving conflicts, post-conflict rehabilitation, bringing East and West together. Uh, and all of these different tools have come to good use in Ukraine, uh, from negotiation on the highest level, our chairperson in office, um, your president and uh, foreign minister Didier Burkhalter, from the beginning um, has been very active in negotiating. Um, he proposed a road map near the beginning of the, of the crisis. Um, the Swiss chairmanship uh, uh, was instrumental in having the Minsk uh, uh, contact group uh, which is negotiating pre presently with Russia, with Ukraine, also speaking with the representatives of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, um, and have uh, recently negotiated the ceasefire, down to a whole series of, of, of interventions. Uh, our institutions for human rights, for media freedom, for national minorities have been on the ground uh, with observation missions and have reported to the uh, participating states. Of course, what the OSCE is most well known for, we've uh, been monitoring elections, the presidential election, and we will be monitoring the, the parliamentary election. The presidential election, we had a thousand observers on the ground. It was the largest election monitoring mission the OSCE has ever carried out. And these are not just uh, 
uh, monitoring missions for the day of the elections, but uh, go for months before the election and, and follow up for months uh, uh, afterwards. Um, of course, uh, the special monitoring mission was uh, uh, an example of how the OSCE also is very flexible and uh, managed to reach consensus with all 57, all uh, decisions are taken by consensus in the organization, and this one as well. And uh, as a result of this decision in March, um, there are monitors in 10 cities in Ukraine, including in the East, um, who send daily reports to the participating state on what they see. There are the eyes and ears on the ground, and they engage uh, with the population. They engage with interlocutors who approach them. Um, we have observers uh, on uh, two border crossing points uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. So we're working very intensely in Ukraine uh, with uh, the tools that we have. And the idea for this discussion is to take a breath and to look away from Ukraine for a moment. Because at the periphery of, of, of our vision in all of this work is that things are actually very different. Um, this is not really just uh, Cold War uh, uh, confrontation. There are elements here um, which maybe aren't new in Ukraine, but we're seeing that our security situation really has moved on since the 1990s. Just to name two examples, um, the war in, in Eastern Ukraine, what kind of a war is it? I mean, we, there, it, it there's a lot of confusion. We, we all know uh, that uh, threats that go out uh, these days are not so much interstate wars, but intrastate conflicts, ethnic conflicts and so on, or transnational threats, transnational crime, terrorism. But what do we have here? It's not really clear. The definitions are changing, are shifting, and the very confusion actually is an important part, it seems, of the conflict. So this is something new, and uh, is something to reflect about if we want to think about how our security situation has changed. To name another example, the Maidan. Um, it was the Maidan that triggered uh, the violence um, that followed. Uh, here we had a celebration of substantive democracy which had something very new about it and something which might uh, be worth uh, reflecting upon and uh, taking up uh, for uh, reflections on what in the entire OCE space uh, might be a way forward. So uh, to make uh, a long matter short, uh, perhaps we should see this discussion today backwards. That is to say, what is on the backdrop of Ukraine our new world looking like? What is it telling us about the security channels and the challenges that face us? And what could a regional organization like the OSCE um, contribute uh, to finding new ways of uh, approaching these matters. So we're very lucky to have a wonderful panel today. All three panelists um, are immersed in uh, knowledge of what's going on in Ukraine and uh, in very different ways, um, I think are uh, extremely suited to uh, lead us in uh, brainstorming together uh, about some answers or some questions. Uh, so let me please uh, first introduce uh, Peter Pomerantsev. Peter Pomerantsev is an award-winning British author and documentary producer. He knows the conflict and its backgrounds from the inside out. Uh, born in Ukraine, he has spent many years uh, in Russia working, producing documentaries there. Um, and uh, therefore um, can uh, give us first-hand insight into um, the situation. Um, he has been a fellow at the Institute, uh, for, at the Institute for Human Sciences uh, in Vienna. He is the author of a forthcoming study uh, on 21st century propaganda and weaponization of information, culture, and money. Also, uh, his forthcoming book, uh, Nothing is True, Everything is Possible, is appearing at the end of this year. The second panelist that I'd like to introduce to you, Timothy Snyder, um, is I believe no stranger to the Graduate Institute, um, professor of history at Yale University um, and specialist in the history of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, he's uh, 
the author of a whole series of award-winning books, the most famous of which um, is Bloodlands, uh, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, um, a history of Soviet and Nazi killings, which tells this story as one uh, unified, uh, uh, well, unified one story. It's one phenomenon, uh, which is a uh, uh, great service to, to the discussion about this uh, area. And at the same time, what I would like to emphasize uh, highlight is uh, uh, his work and also uh, in this in this uh, work in his work uh, Timothy Snyder insists on the fact that history is about lives and uh, the to understand the killings and to understand conflict the question to ask is about lives lived or not lived and uh, that's maybe something that can guide us in our um, questions about Ukraine uh, finally, uh, last but uh, definitely not least, Raza Ostroskaite um, from the OCE. She is the deputy director um, of uh, the Conflict Prevention Center and head of the policy support section. Um, Raza is an expert in the Caucasus. Uh, she has negotiated, uh, she has co-moderated uh, the uh, Geneva International Discussions on the Conflict in Georgia. Uh, she's an expert on uh, European security policy and has written two uh, books on the subject. And she has written a number of very interesting essays about the OSCE, which I would just like to mention one written 10 years ago, um, I don't know if you, <laughs> um, called uh, OSCE a rather, a somewhat different uh, socializing so socialization agency. And uh, we're 10 years farther along the line now, and uh, we'll be very interested to see uh, what Raza has to say about um, the OCE's particular approach uh, to conflict prevention. Uh, I have one more remark. Uh, this um, being an uh, outreach event organized by the communications and uh, media relations section from our side is an informal brainstorming event. That is to say, because the, the OSC is a political organization, it's very important for us to define modalities. This is not uh, an official OSC event, and uh, we from the OSC are speaking in our personal capacity, strictly off the record. If there are media among the public, uh, please, uh, 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 we would ask you to refrain from quoting um, OCE speakers as uh, OCE officials. And with that, uh, I look forward to the discussion and uh, thank you. Would I have to do something with it? It's on? It's on? Okay. Um, so thank you, Ursula, for introducing me and thank you very much for coming. So, um, yes, I, as Ursula mentioned, should I hold it here? Is that better? Um, I'm, a, I'm a television producer and I'm a, um, a sort of journalist. I'm not a, an academic or a, or a practicing political scientist. So I'm going to try and talk about the challenges that I think that we see crystallizing from this conflict from my own point of view. And maybe that'll feed into a more academic and, and uh, sort of um, political science debate further on. So, you know, I, 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 you know, I make TV programs and I write articles, and I'm a, I consider myself to be um, what I would call a, a, a First Amendment fundamentalist. Um, you know, I, I, I believe in the sort of uh, the sacredness almost of freedom of speech and uh, freedom of information. But as I've been following Russian media over a decade, and as I've been looking at the way Russia has sort of expanded its information campaign during the course of the Ukrainian conflict, I'm struck with a sort of a moment of almost cognitive dissonance. Um, because really, at least from 2008, there's a, an intellectual movement inside the security and intelligence establishment in Russia to talk about information as a weapon, not as a means of debate, not even as a means of persuading the other side, not in, not in the sense of public diplomacy or, or propaganda the way that maybe Bernays would understand propaganda. But they talk about information as a weapon to confuse, to demoralize, to sabotage, um, and so on and so forth, in a purely sort of military uh, and intelligence paradigm. 
And we've seen this happen inside of Russia for a while. Now I think we're seeing this being used very aggressively outside of Russia. So let's take Russia today, which I don't actually think is a very serious project, but in terms of its impact, but I think it's very interesting to show various kind of forms of, of practice. So Russia today doesn't actually try to, um, as it claims, um, persuade the other side, the West or, or whoever, it works in different languages, not just, not just sort of um, English and, uh, and French, it also has sort of Arabic channels. Um, it doesn't try to persuade anybody of Russia's position. It doesn't try to sort of f create a debate around the future of the world. Um, it doesn't play the role that maybe Al Jazeera plays in sort of shifting the framework of the debates to a more kind of sort of left-wing perspective. Um, it, it, it's, it's involved in 21st century, uh, what the KGB used to call uh, active measures. Um, it uh, spreads uh, disinformation. Um, uh, as in, like, it just makes stuff up. It made up a, uh, a massacre by the rebels in Syria, together with Syrian state TV. It, um, it uses um, sort of confusion as, as a way of sort of, uh, uh, as, as, as a foreign policy tool. We saw that after MH17, Russia today started spitting out conspiracy after conspiracy after conspiracy, just to dull the sort of the reaction to what had happened. There was, no, there was no question of trying to convince or put forward a version. This was just information used to, um, as sort of suppressive fire, you know, just to make everyone really, really confused and dug. Um, and most importantly, and I think most insidiously, uh, and it's a very much continuation of what's been happening in Russia, it practices forms of discourse which make any type of debate impossible. So the main thing they push is conspiracy theories as a form of thinking. And conspiracy theories are obviously the place that we get to where sort of ideology and discourse fall off a cliff. The whole point of a conspiracy theory is that it can't engage in any sort of debate. Um, you see the same thing in the use of trolls who, by, by, by the Kremlin. So the trolls go out there, and the whole point of the trolls is to kill the debate, not to continue it. So I'm left in this very, very confusing situation where I love the idea of a lot of different channels from lots of different parts of the world involved in a, in a sort of fruitful uh, exchange of information and ideas to uh, produce a future of, uh, that will look like the sort of, you know, like, like, like a UN, UN wet dream. But what do you do when you have um, a state that is using information and abusing the idea of freedom of information for disinformation and is using freedom of speech to destroy the very possibility of freedom of speech? This is a very insidious idea, and it's maybe best expressed by, not by me, I didn't coin this, by Vasily Gatov, who was, um, he was actually one of the heads of Rio Novosti when it was a good thing, uh, and now is somewhere else. Uh, so a, a Russian journalist uh, and sort of media guru, and he put it very well, I thought. Um, he conceptualized it very well. He said that um, if, in the 21st, if in the 20th century the main challenge was the battle for freedom of speech, for freedom of information, against censorship, in the 21st century the main battle is going to be with the abuse of freedom of information by malign states, corporations, terrorists. Because we've got to understand that what Russia is doing now will, I fear, be used increasingly by any number of rising states, companies, whoever wants to abuse information in this way. So I think we risk standing before a deluge of disinformation in the 21st century. We have neither the analytical capacities, let alone the institutional capacities, to even start to deal with that. Um, and I'll just round off by saying, I've taken information as an example, because this is the, the confusing world that I work in. Really, R Russia is doing the same thing um, with uh, other elements, sort of other pillars of, of our idea of globalization. So, we also have an idea that exchange of culture is a good thing. You know, c c culture is a good thing. It's good to have different churches from different countries working together, different NGOs representing different countries working together. I mean, the Kremlin is not particularly sort of uh, subtle in its approach. It talks about it quite openly. If you go back to this, uh, the documents about the setting up of Ruski Mir, which is the Russian compatriots NGOs abroad, they are talked of quite openly as a foreign policy tool to subvert foreign countries. Um, we don't know how to deal with this. We always think that it's great to have sort of like uh, sort of NGOs of other cultures in our in our countries. But what do you do when these NGOs are being used very very strategically uh, and very very focusedly to to for malign ends? Um, and even there's an increasing trend to use the Russian Orthodox Church this way. 
Um, and that's the culture. So we have a weaponization of information, a weaponization of culture, and most importantly, because the other two are important, but of course the most important one is the weaponization of money. Um, the use of money as a, a, uh, a tool to, I love this Russian term, rashatovich, um, other countries, to sort of uh, shake and undermine other countries. Uh, I mean, I come from London, where we really have a kind of a, a cult of the city of London, a cult of commerce, under, underlined by an idea that commerce will lead to international peace. That's kind of our philosophy. It's certainly what this country believes, seems to believe in as well. Uh, what do you do when you have a player that uses money and companies and corruption as a way to subvert other countries? So those are kind of the, 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 the issues that we're dealing with. And every time I get into, I was in Kiev the other week and I was you know, drinking with some journalists and I was like, what do we do about Russia and Ukraine? It's not just about Russia and Ukraine. Russia is sort of the avant-garde of a malevolent globalization and the technologies it is pioneering, I fear are gonna be taken up by everyone, basically. Didn't make up a lot of these technologies. You know, a lot of these things are present in covert American operations, but Russia has systematized them, focused them, and funded them in a way we haven't seen before. So what I'd like to do is um, I expand some of these themes and perhaps put them in, in, in a slightly different language. Um, what I'd like to do is consider this particular challenge, beginning where Peter left off with, with, with the fundamental observation that this is not really about Russia or Ukraine or even Russia and Ukraine, but about the end of one epoch and the beginning of another one. I want to try to consider two of the basic pillars of the Helsinki Final Act and indeed the world in which we all live or believe we live but no longer, in fact, inhabit. Um, those, those two pillars are, are, are sovereignty and, and human rights. Now, I want to consider these concepts as things which have themselves been fundamentally uh, transformed, permeated, manipulated, mutated, uh, to use Peter's term, weaponized, and ask how they might be, if they might be recovered, and if so, how. So to begin from human rights, I want to say one word about human rights as an individual matter, and one, words about, one word about human rights as a collective matter. The striking thing about the Maidan, or one of the striking things about the Maidan, was the very traditional attitude towards human rights. That is to say, if you look at the beginning and the expansion of the protest in Kiev, it begins because of violence against students. It escalates after the first death. The first death in January 2014 was treated by people on the Maidan as some kind of enormous violation of a taboo. One death, one person, one Armenian by the way, one person killed was seen as something which utterly transformed a movement effectively into a revolution. What followed from that was mass shooting and, and change of government. But the, the, the critical turning point was that one life was one life too many. And no matter how one reasons about human rights, whether you begin from Kant or whether you begin from Husserl and the phenomenological tradition or whether you just begin from common sense, it seems to me that that is extraordinarily interesting. You can't really, do it, you can't really reason about human rights unless you have the notion that human rights in, are, are invested in an individual and an individual who is beaten or killed has had their rights violated. That then, which is now traditional, right? That then um, comes into conflict with an interesting the opposing idea of, of individual life, which one sees in the Donetsk and Lugansk people's republics, where a very specific kind of political technology has been applied, a very insidious but effective kind of political technology, which takes in a way the opposite approach. The idea is, and it's going to sound brutal when I put it to you, but I hope I can convince you that's what's happening. The idea is, if I can get you to kill someone by way of a lie, which I can, not personally, but by way of the technologies that Peter is talking about, we can get some of you to kill somebody. If I can get you to kill someone in the name of a lie, that lie is then true. Because it is impossible for you to confront the, po the possibility that you have killed someone for no reason. Right? 
In the case of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, the basic lie was that the fascists were coming. People who believed that the fascists were coming carried out acts of violence against individuals who had no connection with fascists or Ukraine or anyone else, who were often just truck drivers trying to make deliveries. The moment, however, that violence has been carried out against individuals, it must be true, right? If I beat a truck driver because he's a fascist, he must then be a fascist, right? Um, so in this, in this form of political technology, which is entirely deliberate, the individual life takes on an entirely different instrumental meaning. An individual death becomes a way of uh, converting lies into the truth. And of course, this, this happens on an individual scale and it happens on a larger scale as well. The entire Russian military intervention is like this. Russian soldiers who have killed Ukrainian soldiers or Ukrainian civilians are acting on the basis of a lie. Now, I would, like to, I would like to make the claim that it's not just that the people who are killed and beaten are having their rights violated. As we think about what human rights might mean in the 21st century and as to how we might respond to these challenges, I would also suggest that the people who are beating and killing have also had their rights violated. That is to say, there, there might be something like a right not to be exposed constantly to monopolizing hate speech. Right? There might be a right not to just be surrounded all the time by hate speech, which puts you in situations where you might beat or kill another person in the name of a lie. It might be that we might think about human rights expansively that way. And I mean this quite seriously. I think that people who end up committing violence in these situations or killing what's worse in these situations have had something done to them which cannot be undone. And if they themselves die in the name of a lie, Something also has been done to them. So consider the way that Russian soldiers who have come to Ukraine and killed are treated if they die, right? They are buried in unmarked graves. They are brought back as cargo. Why is that, right? Because they have done something in the name of something which cannot be discussed. So I would say if you're buried in an unmarked grave as a soldier, something has been done to you. Your right has been violated. So I, I would like to suggest a connection here between individual rights um, and the absence of hate speech that hate speech itself, especially when it's conveyed in a massive way, is a rights violation. Not just the people who are the direct victims of it, but also the people who are motivated by it and who might themselves die as a result of it. I think their rights might have been violated too. Okay, collective rights. Now, what I'd like to suggest here is that collective rights might also be, uh, have also been abused in a fairly systematic way, which, regard, which forces us to, to think about how we might again try to re reframe them. Um, as you all know, um, the, Russian, the series of Russian interventions in Ukraine, starting with the invasion, occupation, annexation of Crimea, um, and then the support of separatism and the subsequent invasion of Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts, were based on the, base, were based on the claim that the, violate, that the rights of Russian speakers in Ukraine have been violated. Now, what I want to suggest is that this is not just a kind of mistake which we should be debating and discussing for a year. What I want to suggest is that this kind of claim might itself be categorized as a sort of abuse. That if, that, that if, you, if you make claims that are, that are absurd about human rights, that that might be an abuse, right? It's a, it's a frivolous comparison, but in the same way in so, as, in, as in football, if you fake a foul and fall down, right, you can also get carded for that. If you make a claim um, that someone else's rights are being violated, that is itself a kind of human rights abuse. Now, I can't, let me just assert that these claims are absurd. It is for, in, on a series of levels. One level is free speech in Russian is much more developed in Ukraine than it is in Russia itself, right? Um, the second is that, a second, there, there, there's a whole list, but a second is that in Lugansk and Donetsk, the places where supposedly the rights of Russian speakers are being violated, Nobody actually speaks Ukrainian, right? It's, these are Russian-speaking regions. If anything, if you only speak Ukrainian and not Russian, right, you're going to have a much harder time in Lugansk and Donetsk because people will make fun of you. They won't necessarily respond. They will certainly not respond to you, almost certainly, in your, in your own language. So there's something quite absurd about this. And there's another level, though, which is that, and this is profoundly interesting for Europeans and maybe even for, for, for Swiss, um, the Maidan, the revolution in Ukraine itself was not about language. It was not about ethnicity at all. 
I mean, I mentioned earlier that the first victim was an Armenian, the second was a Belarusian. Um, it was not about language. On the Maidan, people spoke Russian for the very simple reason that Russian is one of the two languages of Ukraine, like French is one of the two languages of Switzerland. Uh, the self-defense battalions on the Maidan spoke Russian, okay? Um, the intellectuals, many of them, spoke and wrote in Russian. Um, even some of the Ukrainian nationalists, including the leading one, are Russian speakers. Uh, you, you, can, you can multiply these examples, but the fundamental point is that Kiev is a bilingual city. It is the most bilingual, and in that sense, the most cosmopolitan capital in Europe. The idea that somehow ethnicity and language were behind this is fundamentally absurd. So what I want to, what I want to claim is that what, has, what is happening here is a, is a kind of human rights, I think, abuse. Um, not only are you trivializing claims about collective rights, but if you do it from afar, so if you do it in Moscow with respect to people in Ukraine, you are transforming individuals into objects. You're removing their own right to define themselves as individuals, as citizens, or whatever it might be. And if you use this as an excuse to destroy a state or to destroy a state settlement, which is also what's happening, you, you're, you're, you're doing something quite extraordinary. Um, so I, you might formulate this as saying that you have a right, like, as an individual, not to be ethnicized by a foreign power, right? That the fact that I'm speaking English does not mean that the, you know, the Queen of England at any point can claim me as her subject, right? That I should have a right, it sounds absurd, but that is exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened and is happening in Ukraine, right? If you speak French, that doesn't make you a French citizen. Um, so that the, the right not to be ethnicized by a foreign power might also be a kind of right which is worth thinking about. That, of course, is not only the lesson of today, it's the lesson of 1938. Um, which brings me to the, the, the next kind of, of, of right I wanted to speak about, which is that the right not to be, um, not, not to be involved in a humanitarian disaster, which of course what is, which is what's happening now in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. There was no ethnic conflict or meaningful violent conflict in these regions for 25 years. There was not an ethnic conflict going on there now. Um, what, what there is is an external intervention supporting people who in some, in some sense I think have legitimate political aspirations to autonomy, um, most of whom were not willing to fight for that, some of whom were. But the result of this foreign intervention is a humanitarian disaster in which something like five million people, five million people, that's a lot of people, are without access to electricity, gas, water, food. In most of the zone, which is now under the separatists, money does not function anymore, you're in a barter economy, and winter is coming. So it's very probable that far, far more people are now going to die of hunger, disease, um, uh, and, just, and just cold in the next few months as a result of this. We're facing a massive humanitarian disaster um, as winter comes. And by the way, uh, the ceasefire was mentioned, the war has not stopped, just a little reality check, the war did not stop, the ceasefire did not stop the war, the war is still going on, combat operations are taking place as I talk to you right now in the same regions where the ceasefire is supposed to be applying. Okay. So we may be facing the largest humanitarian disaster in post-war Europe, and one right might be not to have people cause massive state-destroying humanitarian disasters in your country. And the, the idea of state destruction brings me to a little coda. Um, the, the, the point I wanted to make, the second big point about sovereignty or stability. There are obvious ways in which Russian policy violates the Helsinki Final Act and in general various kinds of consensus. The occupation, invasion, annexation of Crimea, the invasion of southeastern Ukraine, that's ob those are obviously violations. But what may be um, more problematic is that these violations have a justification. They have a coherent justification. And the justification is that international law as we understand it no longer functions. Um, explicitly and implicitly, um, Russians right up to the level of Lavrov uh, are, are making argument, the foreign minister, are making arguments which reject the positive law tradition um, on which the OSC and pretty much everything else is founded and go back to Carl Schmitt's idea that the only reason rules are interesting is that they, is they demonstrate who can make an exception. Right? That's the only thing rules are for. And in this concept, um, traditional international law, I'm just not going to cite Carl Schmitt now, uh, and state sovereignty are just illusions. The only thing which is significant is the possibility of expanding power. So in Ukraine, you have an example of what happens when someone sees himself as capable of making exceptions and seeing exceptions as defining 
the rule. But it's not about Ukraine. Um, this new approach, which I would call strategic relativism, is about Europe, it's about the world. I call it strategic relativism because, first of all, it dismisses with the idea that law or anything else has any absolute character. But it's also relativism because the basic power position is that is not to make Russia stronger in demographic or economic terms, which is basically impossible. It's to make everyone else weaker and to make Russia thereby relatively stronger. This extends well beyond Ukraine. Ukraine is just act one, or was just act one, of a policy designed to fragment and ultimately destroy the European Union. When Russian propaganda, not just propaganda, when Foreign Minister Lavrov speaks of Europeans as decadent, what follows decadence is disintegration and destruction. That's what decadence means. You are on the way out. You're finished. Something else is going to succeed you. Um, and of course, this is consistent with the general Russian policy of supporting the Front National um, and other much, much less savory groups, including the Nazis and fascists who, uh, who observed the so-called referendum in Crimea, because these are the people who oppose the European Union, who favor moving back to a world of nation states, which of course would be a complete disaster. So the, the, the policy towards Ukraine is really a sideshow. I mean, important as it is, horrifying as it is that five million people are now in this humanitarian disaster, this in a way is just a sideshow. The main theater is Europe itself, the future of the European Union, and of course all other institutions, including the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And it seems to me that given these two fundamental challenges, having to do with rights and having to do with sovereignty, the question for the OSCE, which is facing a legal, moral, philosophical challenge, is whether it is going to accompany this and you know, make it look gentler, right? Um, make it seem more legitimate than it is, or whether it's going to understand this as a fundamental challenge. Because at the end of the day, in this world, there is no room for something like an organization on security and cooperation in Europe. Thanks. <laughs> that's for sure. I think that's that's a good thing because I come from the Finns, so I can stay clear of any geopolitical considerations because this is the prerogative of either scholars on the one hand or participating states on the other, and I'm neither. Um, I was asked to speak about what the OSC has done, is doing, and or can or could do in the case of, of the crisis in Ukraine, and I'll structure my talk accordingly. Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, this year has been an exceptional year for the OSC community. The agenda of the OSC was primarily dominated by the crisis in Ukraine. Um, as you know that in most diplomatic exercises there is a visible and public part and there is also an invisible part, the part which goes behind closed doors. And I'll start with the latter. I think he, this year we have broken a number of what we call internal records. Uh, the number of special meetings of our main decision-making bodies, both the Permanent Council and the Forum for Security or Cooperation, has been broken. We have never had so many meetings, even if, I have to admit, we could not agree on the, on the title of the agenda items under which we will be discussing the Ukraine crisis. We still have two agenda items. One is put by the Russian Federation and one is put by Ukraine, and we discuss it under both. Um, the issue of Ukraine um, has been also subject to um, deliberations under the so-called Vienna document. The mechanism for consultations and cooperation as regards unusual military activities has been triggered 13 times. Just to put this in perspective, the mechanism has not been triggered once in, the, in, in last year or the, the year before that. The last time the mechanism was triggered was in 2008, just prior to the Georgia-Russia war. Um, we had a number of what we call verification activities, inspections, evaluations in Ukraine, 15 to be exact, uh, coordinated by 18 participating states uh, on, on, on the territory of Ukraine. So that indicates that we have a number of, of internal de debates behind closed doors, and of course the debate that, we, you know, the, the two 
a journalist and a professor, um, outlined um, is, is clearly very different than you have both Ukraine and the Russian Federation in the same room. And as, as a number of speakers before me outlined, OSC is a consensus-based organization. That means whether you want it or not, you still have to come up with something, with something that's tangible and that could both the Russian Federation and Ukraine could agree to. So most of the debates that, that we had you, were very heated, very acrimonious, and in most cases inconclusive, because we simply could not agree on, on, on many things. Now, in addition to these what I call exchanges, and like it or not, I think it's important to keep uh, channels of communication open. We also had a number of activities which were spearheaded by, by, by the chairmanship in office, Switzerland, and I, and I recognize a colleague from the, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The president of, of the Swiss Confederation was in daily contact with presidents and, and foreign ministers of both Ukraine and, and the Russian Federation. But not only that, also in touch with colleagues from the so-called Normandy and Geneva formats, the two formats which are very important and without um, context with which probably the visible part to which I'm gonna come to in a minute would not probably have happened. So now coming to the more visible part, the things that you see um, uh, the OSCE engaged. The other day, um, a senior um, American diplomat noted that OSC is reliving or experiencing a renaissance of some sort. Number one, the reports of the OSC are being read by ministers in various capitals. Number two, I think that the number of readership or the readers of the OSC website has gone through the roof. I think we have never seen so many hits on our website. Um, number three, the number of calls that we received from journalists, I think it must have increased by a tenfold. And um, another issue which I also probably um, should, should mention is that we're no longer subjected to questions, what is the OECD doing? I mean, these are embarrassing questions, but previously I think we always had to define it. We're not actually OECD, we are OSCE. Now we no longer need to do that introduction. Quite a few colleagues have already <laughs> mentioned. Everybody seems to know about it. And I think this big change is due to the fact that we have two new operations on the ground. And one is the, um, the special monitoring mission, um, which was established in, in, in March. Although the discussions on the, de on, on the establishment of this mission had been ongoing already for weeks. It was on, the, on, on one late Friday, the 21st of March, that the OSC ambassadors finally agreed to establish and, and, de and deploy a mission to, to Ukraine. As you can imagine, it took a while to both Ukraine and the Russian Federation to agree on, on the so-called mandate or the terms of our deployment. It is by far the largest OSC operation since the 90s, since we sent our monitors to the Balkans. So on that Friday, uh, the decision was uh, reached that at least, or initially, 100 civilian monitors would be deployed to 10 named locations, and that's a big thing which I will come back to you in a minute. Um, and uh, that, the no that the number of monitors could eventually go up to 500. The decision was reached on Friday. By Saturday morning, we already had an advanced team in Kiev. Within three days, we had the first uh, teams of, of, of sometimes just a few uh, uh, experts deployed in all uh, 10 locations that were uh, agreed in the mandate. Currently, we have 250 monitors. 80 of them are in the Donbass area, the area that you were, I mean, uh, the professor just described as, as a humanitarian disaster area, the Luhansk and, 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 and Donetsk regions, especially the security zone, which was recently uh, described in, in the Minsk Memorandum of both 5 and, and 19 of, of, of September. Now, the fact that our reports are being read could be illustrated by the following anecdote. Um, normally, like, on us like usually, our reports are not open to, to public. The reports of our field presences remain restricted. They are circulated only to delegations, to, to the participating states. Now, because of the uh, political pressure, the reports of the SMM were open to public and they are posted online as soon as they are distributed to delegations. So one day we reported on a conversation which, was ha which took place between an SMM monitor and what we called an aide to the president of the Donetsk People's Republic. The following day we received a call um, by the aide who insisted that we show correction because he was not happy that we referred to him as aide. He was a diplomatic advisor. 
Um, so just for you to, to be aware, I mean, the, our reports are being read by, by all, not only by journalists who want to you know, probe and drill deeper, but also by, by both foreign ministry, and whenever we use the, the wrong attribute, then clearly they would be unhappy, but also by, by, by rebels who, despite the so-called propaganda war, also want to make sure that whatever we report is reported favorably also, as, I mean, or at least to a degree uh, reflecting the story that they would like to see reflected. Now, moving to, the, um, to what Ursula mentioned, in addition to what our efforts on the ground in Ukraine, you may, uh, especially those of you who follow the situation in, in, in Ukraine rather closely, you may remember that at some point, Kiev lost control over some of its uh, border checkpoints with the Russian Federation. So there were growing concerns that the border between Ukraine and Russia, especially in the areas of Donetsk and, and, and Luhansk regions, was manned only by Russian border guards on the Russian side. So following intense negotiations in July, the OSC decided to deploy um, a small observation mission to the two Russian checkpoints. I mean, confusingly called Donetsk checkpoint, but it's on the Russian side. It's on, in the Rostov, not the new oblast of, of, of the Russian Federation. So currently we have eight, uh, 16 monitors on the other side of, of, of the border monitoring these two checkpoints. You may be um, uh, um, reminded of, uh, of, a, of a two, the so-called humanitarian convoys, which were sent by Moscow to, uh, to the Luhansk region. Our monitors were there. They're the ones who actually you know, counted the number of trucks and verified that these monitors were quote unquote checked by the Ukrainian uh, uh, border guards or customs officers or not. They're the ones who now report both um, uh, on, a, on a daily and a weekly basis to the permanent council, um, but also to, to, to the public, and, and their reports also open on, 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 on the website. Now, there are two other elements that would respond to the question, what is the OSC doing? Um, one is disarmament. Uh, the um, OSC is, is providing assistance when it comes to demining. As you can imagine, a number of areas which were recently recovered by, 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 by the Ukrainian forces. I mean, some of these areas are mined and there will be a massive undertaking to, to get these areas demined. Um, and second of all is national dialogue. This is the area where clearly we will need to, to get engaged, especially now uh, that the ceasefire has, has, been, uh, has been agreed upon. Uh, we already started some, some of our activities, so we started back in spring in March. Then we sent a number of um, dialogue experts to various um, uh, cities in all over the country and who initiated um, dialogue between different parts of Ukrainian society. Then during the anti-terrorist operation, it was kind of difficult to convince people that they need to be engaged in national dialogue. But now I think we, um, it's, it's high time that we, we re-look re and revisit. Now coming to my concluding part of, of my talk, and that is, so how do we see the situation and, 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 and have we really learned what Churchill's favorite saying is really doing our best good enough or should we aim to do what is necessary? So I will be asking questions that you're right to ask of us. Um, number one, you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned Ukraine, uh, Crimea once and it is very telling. We have no presence in Ukraine, in Crimea and we have no access to Crimea. So you are absolutely right to ask a question. How come? The second question that you may also ask me is how come we only monitor roughly two kilometers of the Russian-Ukraine border? The entire border stretches 2,000 kilometers and the regions of Luhansk and, and Donetsk uh, and, and there, I mean, that stretch of border with the Russian Federation is 900 kilometers. So two out of 2,000 or two out of 900. Another question that you may ask me is, how come we have civilian monitors doing what effectively is a military task, a task of a peacekeeping operation? Who is monitoring ceasefire? Civilian unarmed monitors? You may also ask a question, how come we only have 80 monitors in Donbas, while the rest are spread around the country, especially in the West, why we have not seen any signs of conflict. So these, are, these would be legitimate questions. And now clearly I would have to admit that yes, the OSC could do more and could do better. But for the time being, we are somewhat obliged to do 
somewhat straightjacketed to doing what is politically acceptable. Now, in one tiny diversion to, to conclude, we talk about these geopolitical considerations, and I mentioned that I'm not going to get there, but it seems like the, the, this crisis of European security and what we see now in Ukraine, clearly, it, I mean, the, the crisis of, 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 of European security architecture predates the Ukrainian uh, situation. So we, there are a number of questions that we should be asking. Um, last week in, uh, in New York, on the margins of the United Nations General Assembly, the chairmanship called for a special ministerial event on Ukraine. So we had a number, of, I think it's around 34 foreign ministers speaking on Ukraine. Regrettably, we couldn't agree on what has happened, why it has happened, or nor how to agree on how to address the situation. So, of course, all foreign ministers agreed that the debate needs to continue in Basel at the upcoming foreign, uh, foreign ministerial council of the OEC, which is the main event and, and traditionally takes place uh, in December in, in the capital of the country which chairs the organization. I'm not sure we will see a breakthrough, and, and I'm afraid that muddling through might be the way forward for, for the time to come. But I look forward to your questions. All right, we've had uh, three excellent, well-informed, and provocative presentations. We've got about 30 minutes, a little less than 30 minutes, for questions, comments, uh, challenges from the audience. There are some individuals, I think, who can assist with the microphones, is that correct? Uh, anyway, yes, there we are. Uh, so if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand, and I'll ask that you briefly identify yourself uh, for our speakers and for the audience. I think there are several, quite a few over here on the far left and none to the right at the moment, at least from my vantage point. So, yes, please. Thank you. Andre Liebig, Graduate Institute. Uh, I agree with Peter Pomerantsev that we need a broad spectrum of views on the events that concern us, but I wonder whether, in your opinion, we have received this broad spectrum of views today. Thank you. Why don't we take a couple of questions first, then I'll go to the panelists. So right next to you, please. Ruxan um, Drasic, I'm an independent researcher. I would have two questions, actually, one for uh, Mr. Pomerantsev, which is, Given what you've talked about, how do you see the OSCE fitting in this strategy of weaponization of information by Russia? And for Professor Snyder, um, could you spell out the points of difference between what you call a new strategic development and what the Soviet Union did for 70 years in terms of propaganda and breaking messages and breaking human rights in a lot of European states. Um, I would find that useful to find the points of difference. And also to Professor Snyder, an exercise in counterfactual may be thinking, what do you think Professor Tony Judd would think about this? Uh, there's someone else behind, is that right? Third person? No. Okay, we'll take uh, one more question from the back and then we'll move to the front. Then. Actually, we'll move to responses after this one. Thank you. Um, my name is Julian Templeton. I'm an intern at the Office of Geneva. So my views or question does not at all reflect the UN. As my questions, I would like to uh, emphasize that I I'm seeking personal opinions as well. Um, I actually have a several questions uh, referring to the title, uh, New World, New Challenges, etc., etc. Um, would the main basis for this conclusion be that we're now dealing with confusion, a uh, so-called disinformation war. In fact, evidence, uh, when evidence is not uh, defined by one party of the conflict, what brings us to the conclusion of a new world with new challenges? What now, when a supreme power has now blatantly, uh, sorry, I can't even read my own writing, it's now blatantly defied an international memorandum for what it was part of, uh, and lies admittedly that there were soldiers in Crimea, Russian soldiers, that is. How can the US, the EU, 
uh, even possibly think of lifting sanctions when um, without a new government that has already admitted to these lies and breaking an international memorandum. Um, how do we deal with a so-called rogue or mafia state? And this refers to or um, so-called violations of frameworks uh, that... Sorry, I've got so much writing. But actually, I have another question for... Sorry, too many, I know. But to the Yale professor, um, you mentioned Act 1. I'd also like to go back to what about uh, Georgia, Abkhazia, Tbilisi, etc., etc., who were also seeking EU membership or thinking about it at least. Thank you. First set of responses. So I'll, I think, uh, Peter, the first couple, there are several questions to you, and we'll just go down the row here. So, Peter, first, please. I mean, I, I can't actually help on the OSCE one. I can, I can help formulate the questions that maybe the OSCE will start to address. Um, what does OSCE do about this problem of the abuse of freedom of information? I mean, um, I think what we're lacking to start off with, just two things, and maybe the OSCE representative could, could take up how this could be transferred into action. What we're firstly lacking is um, any sort of real glossary of what propaganda is. Uh, I've been doing this research into the study about... I'm not going to say the phrase. I'm going to say the phrase one more time, then never use it again because I'm sick of it. The weaponization of information. But um, and everyone's like, but everyone does propaganda. Everything's propaganda. Public diplomacy is propaganda. You know, everyone's read Jackie Lul, which I'm sure you will have as well. Everything is propaganda. You open your mouth, it's propaganda. You make eye contact with someone, it's propaganda. The formation of men's attitudes. I love the Alul study of propaganda. I think it's brilliant. It's utterly unhelpful for where we are now, because what? So the first thing is actually an intellectual process to start to define the spectrum of um, communication forms from blatant lies, which are actually the easiest one to, de to define, through to public diplomacy. And then I think to get together, for media actually, to get together and decide what are the rules of the game and develop charters of um, behavior and communications. I mean, I wouldn't like to see top-down censorship. I'd like to see that regulated from inside. I don't know what kind of role the OSC could, could play there. What we need, for example, is like a transparency international of disinformation that would start monitoring and rating these things. But for that, we need an intellectual model to, to do that with. And that, of course, gets into Tim's question. If we're saying that the right to not being a victim of evil bullshit, I shall say, if that is a right, let me put it more elegantly. Let me misquote Pieper on this. So uh, this is a misquote of a, a Thomist 1950s philosopher writing about propaganda. Uh, he said, lying is not a form of communication. It robs people of their right to a share in reality and makes reality-based politics impossible. If we were to sort of start thinking about what Tim kind of invoked, this idea that people have a right not to experience this kind of information abuse, then I guess the OC could start thinking about how one puts that into action. But I'm, I'll ask the OC people, I'd love to know how, how they could uh, push this agenda forward. Um, I didn't understand the spectrum question. I think, let me turn the spectrum question on its head. What's been very, very interesting inside of Russia is that despite all the censorship, there is actually some access to information still. Just the Kremlin's use and manipulation of information channels has been so intense that it's managed to sort of uh, fuzz out a lot of the access to information which actually exists there. Um, so that's actually the challenge that we're, that, that we're looking into. Um, they don't need, they do censor, they've made life hell for independent journalists, but they haven't censored entirely. Um, and they've, they've been using uh, other techniques to, to make sure that they have people's attention. So that's kind of the interesting uh, thing about the spectrum of information. Um, it's not even enough just to have a spectrum of information. Um, I don't know if that was helpful. Before turning to Tim, would either Raza or Ursula want to respond to either Peter's comment or the other questions? I think some of these questions which, that have been posed could not be posed in the context of the OSCE. We could not even agree to the framing of a question. I mean, like, I think, let's, let's face it, I mean, the debate would look very different if we had a representative of the Russian Federation in the room. 
And considering that we would even need to agree on the agenda, I mean, let alone on, on arrive at some kind of answer at the end of it. So I think it's kind of you know naive to 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 expect that an organization which is a consensus based one. Uh, could could discuss about you know propaganda, weaponization of of information. I mean, it could be discussed you know on the margins, but clearly not as part of a, of kind of a core business of EOC. But uh, like the the way the chairmanship has decided to approach the matter is that I, f I find it extremely elegant because this year, by the end of the year, they will they will set up a, a high level panel, a panel of eminent persons, thereby trying to get this debate out of the sterile, very formal. OSC framework, and will give a chance to to more independently minded um, uh, persons. I mean, I guess some of them will be diplomats, some scholars, uh, to approach the matter and to see how the crisis in and around Ukraine has impacted on on the European security. So, and these persons, then this this panel of eminent persons, will be tasked to come up with a set of recommendations that the OSC could potentially in the future take take forward. But again, I mean, the panel will need to be composed of those coming from different, you know, spectrums of of the OSC community. So it's unlikely that it will come up with a set of questions that that you seem to be, you know. Posing now, I think they will need to be. I mean, the question will be: Where do we start? Is is Ukraine the starting point, or is Kosovo the starting point? As some clearly suggest. So, I think we will need to expand a bit and and and, and also have to address some of the matters that but currently we are not discussing or not not not. I know when it comes to. I mean, there was a question about you know Georgia and and etc. I'm um, clearly now for the time being. I mean, I think the main preoccupation of us is is to avoid the creation of a fourth conflict in, in the OSCE area. We already have Transnistria, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and, and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, will Donbass join, 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 join those? And that we would like to avoid. I would just like to add uh, to what uh, Raza said and, and uh, uh, also underline that, of course, uh, setting the agenda at the OSCE is always 90% uh, of the battle. Um, w uh, the idea of expanding the catalog uh, of human rights, uh, as uh, Timothy Snyder has suggested, is an excellent one. But we don't even have, I believe, uh, freedom of expression uh, officially as a human right uh, because that particular right was never agreed. That being said, um, I think uh, the OCE does, of course, have a lot of channels of action, um, not necessarily on the level of uh, diplomatic negotiation, but on the level of its work in the field operations, um, in the countries, in many projects and programs, um, and uh, dealings uh, with levels of government, with officials, with experts, and with civil society. Um, and I'm going to quote you, Raza, in the article that I mentioned, um, that I found so interesting. Um, the OCE's approach of non-prescriptive normative intermediation. A non-prescriptive approach um, to, uh, of persuasion, of gradual norm um, uh, uh, acceptance, gradual uh, change uh, and strengthening uh, of, of civil society. And I have uh, just one question that I would like to ask uh, to all three panelists, and that is, um, if the program is to undermine um, the Europe, the Western world, or the, the, the free world, what makes Europe so vulnerable uh, to this kind of undermining? And what could we look at here um, closer to home for those of us who are from Western Europe uh, to uh, counteract uh, this sort of development. Thank you. Right, thank you also for posing. You'll be the first question in the next round. <laughs> <laughs> so having posed that, but uh, Tim, please. Okay, I'm going to try to handle a few things that were directed at me. Um, with respect to the comparison with the Soviet Union, obviously there's an institutional continuity um, the, the Russian FSB is, is the direct lineal successor of the Soviet KGB. And 
it, it was never the case in the old Soviet Union that, um, it, well, if, there were a few hours with Betty, I guess. But in, in general, in the old Soviet Union, the, the head of the of the security services was not also the president of the country. In that sense, it's a it's a kind of new situation. He's facing a different kind of pluralism. I mean, he's facing a clan pluralism. Um, in the old, it wasn't the case that the NKVD or the, or, the, or the KGB ran the country. There was always the party, and then there was the general secretary. And even if you look at the worst days of the terror, um, the NKVD was not actually running a show. They were checked by, by by the general secretary. What's a little bit different now is that there's no one, there's no general secretary to check the security services because the general secretary is the security services. He's only checked um, by the interests of the various clans, at least as I see the situation. There's tactical continuity. If you look at the propaganda deployed against Ukraine in 2014, it basically reruns Soviet propaganda against Poland in September of 1939. The two main arguments are the state has ceased to exist if it ever existed, and we need to protect our ethnic brethren. Those, that's exactly, you could take long passages of the proclamations issued by the Red Army as they invaded Poland in September 1939, and you'd be unable to distinguish them from what Putin and Lavrov said in, in uh, the spring of 2014, pretty much word for word. Um, and there's also tactical continuity in the use of the national question. I mean, this is going way back into history, but in the 1920s and 30s, the Soviets uh, used the national questions in neighboring countries, not just in Europe, but in Asia, as a way to weaken those states. So there's that. But there's also, I think, a pretty fundamental difference. In Soviet propaganda, there was a kind of confidence which the Russians now lack. There was a confidence that there was a truth, um, that there was some kind of a future. Even in the boring 1970s, you could say that Brezhnev thought that there was a future in which the Soviet Union existed, and he was trying to consolidate that. that that's now changed. Um, Russian propaganda now doesn't, there's no, as, as, as Peter eloquently stressed, there's no underlying message, there's no underlying truth, right? There's no, there's no Marxism anymore, right? There's no system, there's no future, there's no point in the future we're all heading towards. Um, it's not about organizing things, it's about disorganizing things. Um, and this is because I think there's a lot less confidence in the Russian leadership than there was in the Soviet leadership, even this, in the 70s. This means, of course, that they have much more freedom. They can do things which the Soviets could not do, not just technically, but also intellectually, right? So, for example, supporting fascists while, being, while, while, while tr claiming to be anti-fascist that would have been a difficult trick, even for you know the cleverest Soviet propagandist. But they have no trouble with that now, right? There's no problem whatsoever with bringing in fascists to support the Crimean electoral farce, and with claiming that you're in Ukraine to stop the spread of fascism, right? You invite them one day, you stop them the next day, who knows, right? There's no problem if the head of the Donetsk People's Republic is a Nazi, Meanwhile, you're in Donetsk to stop the Nazis, right? I mean, this, this, this sort of thing, even the Soviets would have had trouble with. So they have much more freedom. But with the freedom comes loss of control. So Russian public opinion is much more out of control, I would venture to guess, than Soviet, than Soviet public opinion was. If you fight a foreign war, you face the risk that it's too popular. Right? And then that can constrain you. I don't think that was possible in the Soviet Union. Also, you can get out of control in the sense that your strategic propaganda doctrine can end up pushing you much closer to China than maybe you want to be, which I think is what's happening. I mean, I think, I think Russia in 50 years was going to end up being a satellite of China, probably. Now we're down to like five years, in large measure because the Russians have lost control of what they themselves are saying. So there are consequences to this. Like having, to, having too much freedom also has consequences. Um, on the, I'm just going to pick out the EU question of the, of the questions that were asked from here. I, it seems to me that the, 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 we didn't talk about this, but the, the, fundamental, the fundamental turn in Russian-EU relations came in 2013 with the enunciation of the Eurasian Project and the Eurasian Doctrine, which involved already, as a matter of policy, um, the, the, the aim of weakening or disintegrating the European Union. Ukraine is just a test of that. I think it's different than Georgia. And the reason, and the fundamental difference is it's not really about NATO anymore. NATO is just a smokescreen. The reason why the Russians talk about NATO is so that, because they like to talk about Americans. Because if you talk about Americans, then you can talk about global conspiracies and yada yada. Um, but this is about the European Union. And the only, oh, they also talk about the Americans because that helps them with their European propaganda. Because then you can get a lot of Europeans to say, well, if Ukraine is just about America intervening in Ukraine, 
Right. If it's just a, if, if the Maidan was an American plot, well, then we're against it too. You know, um, and, and that's of course utter nonsense. I mean, American non-policy to Ukraine was just a horrible, shameful incident, which continues. But the the the, the NATO is now in it. NATO is now in it as propaganda. They, they're not really concerned about NATO. They're really concerned about the European Union. And they get the Europeans thinking that it's about NATO just basically as a matter of, of sleight of hand. And that's different. For me, that's different. That's not only different from the Soviet Union, that's different from Russia until 2013. Okay, so, so Tony Jutt, what would, what would, Tony, what would Tony Jutt say? Um, I, 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 th I mean... You, you, you know, one always has to be one has to be very careful about you know quoting one's deceased friends. Um, but I, I, I think we can we can say with some confidence on the basis of the last thirty years of his work that 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 Tony Jutt would have thought that you have to have conceptual clarity on your side, um, not because that means you're going to win. It probably doesn't. But if you don't have conceptual clarity on your side, it means you've already lost. The important part of the battle, which is knowing who you are and what you stand for. Conceptual clarity isn't going to defeat propaganda, but without conceptual clarity, you can just you can just say goodbye to the whole thing. I love the Tony Yud question. Um, it's funny. There was an interview with Tony Yud right well, not an interview. He wrote, he wrote an article right before he died, and where he said he's talking about sort of the legacy of, of having grown up and having been educated at King's College in Cambridge in the 60s, which was sort of the, um, um, sort of the front line of sort of postmodernist uh, thinking and anti-establishment thinking. And he was like, what we started then was meant to be a liberational project, and it's gone far too far. It's actually got to the point now where you just can't, you know, postmodernism has become a satire of itself. It was a very, very powerful essay in The Guardian, and, and, and a very sort of one of the last things he wrote. And I'd like to swing that into Russia. Um, it's, it's, it's funny, uh, Tim used the term strategic relevant, re relativism. If Russia has an ideology, if the Kremlin has an ideology, and this expresses itself both in its art and in its politics, the way the politics is practiced, and certainly in its propaganda, is that there is it's this sort of like very, very cheap, um, uh, grotesque satire of postmodernism, that there is no such thing as truth. And I think there's a very strange echo with, with the 20th century. If that was a case of taking Marxism, which was also meant as a liberational philosophy, and then making it into a grotesque satire of itself, and turning a liberational philosophy into an authoritarian practice, we actually see something similar, not something as disciplined, but a, a strange echo of that with, with postmodernism. Uh, so Russia has taken the ideas of postmodernism and, and made a grotesque, autocratic um, uh, festival out of it. And I guess that's what also why part of the reason why the Europe has such a struggle um, dealing with this. Um, because uh, Russia says there is no such thing as truth. That's, they say this all the time. The managing editor of Russia Today, the main idea is there is no such thing as truth, therefore we can lie. But, you know, I grew up in being taught by people like Tony Yud, being taught by the 60s generation, and we were told pretty much from year one there is no such thing as truth. Um, so in a very, it's, it's, we're talking about real undergraduate philosophy here. We're not talking about deep stuff. We're talking really undergraduate King's College Polytechnic, that weird kind of connects between the intellectual elites and the intellectual uh, sidelines. Uh, and that's what Russia is playing on um, quite a lot. So that was a bit of an aside. I just remembered that wonderful Tony Yud essay. Sorry. Okay, I, I, should we take more questions? I think we should take some more questions. Uh, we've got uh, only, though, about five, six minutes. So uh, keep your questions focused, and we'll start right here. Uh, thank you um, for a very interesting uh, discussion. And can please identify yourself. Uh, yeah, I'm a student uh, in the Graduate uh, Institute here. Um, I would just like the speakers to make a little bit of comparison of the situation uh, of Soviet Union invading Afghanistan uh, with Soviet Union invading Ukraine. At that time, um, systematically, doctrine of jihad was created to defeat uh, Soviet Union, and that did happen. Uh, led to the dismemberment of Soviet Union and ultimately leading to the unification of Germany. But then EU was too late in embracing Ukraine. Um, it, Ukraine was after EU to be part of uh, European Union and they were looking for free trade agreements and uh, several things. So uh, was, was it... Uh, I mean, had it been part of EU or there had been more progress on that, um, uh, embracing Ukraine, was it possible to avoid 
um, this type of a, a thing? Or what do you think is an ideology which is required now to defeat uh, uh, Russia uh, in, in future invasions? Because we have seen the consequences of that doctrine uh, which was created to defeat Soviet Union. Uh, so, so what is there now? Doctor. Uh, question back. Right there. Uh, sir, yeah. Hi. Thank you very much for your discussion. I'm a student at the Institute. My question was that you have talked about how um, disinformation as a foreign policy and disinformation as a tools of war, but I was thinking, do you think this is a completely new phenomenon in international politics? Because, for example, in 2003, the British-American invasion of Iraq, there was a story that there was weapon mass destruction, and it turned out to be not completely true, I mean, according to the press, for example. So I was thinking if this phenomenon of disinformation as a foreign policy is particularly specific to Soviet Union or Russia, or can this strategy be applied by other powerful countries in the world? Thank you. Turn that one off, please, thanks. Uh, one more question, Sean Mark, please. Is it working? Okay. Um, my name is Jean-Marc Fikiger. I'm working for the Swiss Germanship. Um, I just have one comment and perhaps one question to Timothy Snyder. Um, the comment I want to make um, is just I want to rebound on what uh, Raza was, was telling before about um, the Swiss Germanship. Now, um, um, there was this discussion last week um, in New York at the side event, and um, I think the foreign ministers that were there couldn't agree on many things, but I think um, they agreed on one thing, is that uh, there is a crisis of uh, European security and that we should address um, this crisis. I think this is more or less what we can say uh, that they agreed upon. And, and my question to Timothy Snyder um, um, would be, um, if you were in the driving seat um, of the organization, and now we have this reform process called Helsinki Plus 40, which is um, basically about making the organization fit for the 21st century. Um, what, what would be your suggestion uh, concerning, uh, if we consider the analysis you just made about, um, well, the, the situation um, in Europe? Okay, I know there are several other people who would like to raise questions, but let me just say that uh, several, most of the panel uh, has agreed to stay on after 2 o'clock and will meet informally in the cafeteria. So anyone interested in carrying on the conversation can continue it uh, there with at least most of, of the panelists. Some of us have to go and teach classes, but uh, most of the panelists will be there. So um, final round, maybe reversing the order this time, starting with Tim, is that okay? And then, and then we'll just go down, down the row for some final comments. So we can end it too. Okay, on, on, the, on the question, I'm gonna simplify your question a little bit and just talk about Ukraine and the European Union. Uh, the European Union is not a strategic organization that, that admits members for strategic reasons. I mean, that's how it's kind of portrayed by Russia now, but it's not. It never really has been. Its lack of strategy is one of its most charming characteristics. Um, the, 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 um, the, the, the what what needed to ha so the, the reason why Ukraine is not in the European Union has everything to do with Ukraine um, and with the disaster after the last revolution of 2004 2005. There's no way that responsible you know, foreign ministers of member states or commissioners could really recommend that Ukraine, with its immense levels of corruption and problems with the rule of law, be admitted to the European Union. It just it, that was not in the cards, um, uh, and th that that I think. It, the, in a way, the tra the tra one of the many aspects of the current tragedy is that the Maidan was not about Russia or ethnicity or language or any of these dreadful things that we're now preoccupied with. It was about, it was prompted by an association agreement with the European Union, right? People wanted an association agreement with the European Union. At a time when people across European capitals were marching against the European Union in one way or another, people in Kiev were marching for the European Union because they quite rightly associated the association agreement with the prospect of rule of law and with predictability in their own lives, which is what they want. 
you know, the, the movement was about predictability, the rule of law, very simple things which in Switzerland or, you know, Connecticut you can take for granted. And those are the things which Ukraine will actually have to have before it joins the European Union. I mean, even if this war, you know, even if I could snap my fingers and make the war stop, Ukraine would have to still do a huge amount to join the European Union. It's not just a strategic decision or strategic mistake. The rule of law has to be, has to be built up in that country. And the, the tragedy is that that is what this movement was all about. Um, and in war, of course, makes it much more, much more difficult. Um, on on the question of like, do regimes use disinformation? Of course, regimes use disinformation, re regardless of, of 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 what they are. I mean, the the basic logical point to make here is that if it's bad when one country does it, it's also bad when another country does it, and generally, it's bad, right? So, you, what you can't do is say. Russia does this, but on the other hand, America did this, and China did that, and no, it's always bad. If it's bad, then it's always bad. I mean, I wrote a, when, when we began the war with Iraq, I wrote a long article, you know, about George Orwell in the United States. I mean, basically the most critical thing, I think, that anybody wrote at the time, and it, I, could, I actually could not publish it in the United States. I had to publish it in Britain. Um, and I'm, I stand by that. I mean, I thought we did use Orwellian propaganda in 2003 to get ourselves in, into a ridiculous war. And, and for that reason, I'm not, you know, I'm not in the same boat with many of my colleagues. But um, that said, that doesn't make it okay that Russia does the same thing. It makes it also bad. It's always lie. It's always bad to lie to start a war, regardless of who's doing it. And unfortunately, as Peter Pomerantsev and others have conventionally argued, the Russians have taken propaganda to a completely different level. I mean, they make us look like illiterate eighth graders. They're so much better at this than we are. And they always were. Frankly, I mean, during if the if the Cold War had been won or lost on propaganda, they would have won. Fortunately, it wasn't it wasn't won or lost on propaganda. Um, if it had been won or lost on intelligence, they also would have won. There are whole realms of, of 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 statecraft in which they were just much better than we were. But it was won on something like perceptions of economic growth. Therefore, you know, it went the way that it did. Um, but 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 so. Uh, it's true what you say, but I wouldn't I wouldn't use it to relativize the current situation. In the current situation, the Russians have actually developed techniques and which seem to be much, much more effective. Uh, if you look at public opinion ratings, if you look at support for war, if you look at the level of, 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 of uh, misunderstanding of what's actually happening, so 95% of Russians are against invading Ukraine, which is interesting because they've already done it, right? They're, their country is already invaded, but 95% of them are against the prospect of invading Ukraine. And the reason for that is that the situation in Ukraine has been defined domestically in Russia as a liberating struggle of you know, Russians inside Ukraine. So they're against Russia invading Ukraine, but that's already happened. In America in 2003, things were bad, but they weren't that bad. Um, they weren't even nearly that bad. So there is unfortunately a qualitative, a qualitative change, and I, I really would, I, I would counsel very strongly against relativizing this and saying that because America did something bad, we did a lot of bad things. Therefore, things in Russia are basically honky-dory. That's the way that I would, it would be very, look, it'd be very, that is, I mean, this is, I'm now going well beyond what you said. You asked the question in a totally innocent way, but I just wanna, I, I wanna make the, I wanna make the additional point that it's very important not to talk too much about the United States when things don't really concern the United States. This is a big European problem. I'm aware that you might not be European. I'm just not looking at everybody else. A big European problem is that when something happens in Russia, you immediately start talking about the United States. It's, that is a way of changing the subject, and it's been the most effective Russian propaganda tactic, in my opinion. This whole idea that, it's a ge that Ukraine is a geopolitical struggle between the US and Russia, that's a very powerful idea because if it's a geopolitical struggle between the U.S. and Russia, well, then maybe we should stop the U.S. Maybe Russia is the small guy, not the big guy. Maybe Russia is the victim. Maybe we should help them out, right? And if it's about and and even and at some subconscious level, if it's about the U.S. and Russia, maybe we Europeans don't have to do anything because whatever is going to happen is going to the Americans. Unfortunately, the Americans aren't doing anything, right? I mean. A, sad to say. And so it really is about you. You know, the United States is not going to fall apart anytime soon, I don't think. The European Union might, right? Um, the, you know, the, Russia's, Russia's policies are much more effective against the European Union than they are against the United States. So it's very important when things come up not to just talk about America. Okay, I'll stop this little spiel. I'm sorry, I took your question way too far. But, but it seems like it's important. Um, with respect to you know, what I would do if I were the head of the, o, of the, head of the OSC, I think there's, you know, I, I tried to spell out everything I could think of. I think there's some things to be highly traditionalist and conservative about, like state boundaries. And I think there's some things that one has to think out again, which is the nature of challenges to human rights in 2014 as opposed to 1975. That's a, I did the best I could in the talk. I'm afraid I can't do any better than that. Ross, some closing remarks. Just one kind of, you know, dying year afterward, um, 
clearly is, is coming from within the organization. But I don't have the luxury of commenting on invasion to Afghanistan or invasion of, 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 of Ukraine. But what I can comment is that most of the time now we're busy with dealing much more operational issues, how to keep the ceasefire holding. OSCE, because of its inclusive membership, is the only acceptable partner on the ground, both the Russians and the Ukrainians, including the rebels, do agree that we will be the ones who will be monitoring the ceasefire. We will be defining what a ceasefire violation constitutes. And we will be the ones who will be monitoring the Ukraine-Russia border and the perimeter of the entire security zone. So for us, it's more about, you know, getting things done on the ground and, and addressing what might actually be a humanitarian situation uh, also with the onset of winter. So it's we don't necessarily always have the luxury of getting above and, 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 and getting this more philosophical discussion what it means for sovereignty or human rights. It's more about these very, very operational issues. Yeah, I, I thought Tim covered the, 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 um, the disinformation issue very well. I'll just tell, tell a couple of, of um, uh, give a couple of little examples. And there's two things going on. Firstly, Russia, because it, is, it feels itself to be weak, it needs what Putin calls asymmetric responses. And this is actually me almost quoting him, we need to be more intelligent than the other side because they're stronger than we are. So that, he said that in 2004. Um, uh, and so, yes, it is very much a case of using disinformation techniques or, or covert propaganda warfare, whatever you want to call it, um, and kind of making that the system. So America's, the Iraq war, Guatemala is the one that the Russians are always quoting to me. Whenever you meet a Russian, they go, oh, what about Guatemala 52 and the bananas? And like, yep, that was pretty, that's fair game. And then the other one they love to quote is the Helen Noten uh, PR um, fabrication about uh, Iraqi Kuwaiti babies being, being killed by Iraqi soldiers, which was made up by a PR company. The thing is, and also they've start quoting Chomsky. They love Chomsky. They love quoting Chomsky at one. But the sense is that they've read Chomsky and instead of going, wow, we must rebel in an anarcho-socialist way, they're like, no, we're going to do this. This is great. Um, and, so, and so they've taken all these techniques. They've put them together. The West just doesn't have a Russia today, which is, has financing of between 300 million and a billion. We don't really know how much. It just doesn't have it. Um, it's become the strategy, partly because they feel weak. So they feel they can't use all the other sort of techniques that we have. So it's like taking the worst elements of the Western system and then putting them on crack. But, 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 and here's something else. This is also a little bit of a rhetorical trick they use because the best propaganda in the 19th century came from the Okhrana. I was rereading Andrei Bieli recently uh, and this wonderful world of disinformation that the Okhrana could create in the 19th century is, is a different level to what sort of like the American, you know, proto-secret services could create then. Sorry, sorry. So, I mean, there is no better piece of disinformation and propaganda than the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I say this almost with pride as a Russian. We are so much better at telling stories than you guys will ever be. <laughs> well, on that note, there, there are uh, obviously a lot of other questions, a lot of other issues. This has been, been fascinating. I, I actually would, I wish the panel could join my course on theories and theorists this afternoon where we're going to be talking about conceptions of power, but I've got a few ideas where to take this from there. But please join me in thanking our panel and thanking the OSC for co-hosting this with the Graduate Institute, a very illuminating discussion. Thank you. <laughs> As I said earlier, those of you wishing to have informal discussion with most of the panel can join us in the cafeteria in a few moments. So.